yes we are live yes sir live. so now we are in live uh, so uh, we can start now sharanun sir ah uh, sir uh, hello sorry sir i had some technical issues some connective pro connectivity problems so i could not uh, come back sir uh, on behalf of uh, tnoa we uh, first uh, i think extend our gratitude and thanks to uh, dr ajay prasad chetty for having agreed to you know enlighten our post graduates about uh, tb spine sir and uh, coimbatore has got two towering personalities in orthopedics one is our president and other is uh, dr ajay prasad chetty sir and uh, such heights, a agree <laughs> Yes, sir. And uh, such a senior person today, and uh, it's a great opportunity for PGs to interact with them. And uh, about the moderator, Sudhir is a very good friend, friend of mine, sir. And uh, uh, I know him from his postgraduate days in Ganga Hospital when he came for a medical exam. Very committed and a very dedicated person, and uh, definitely climbing the ladder, sir. And uh, very soon, I think he will uh, reach uh, uh, the top. And uh, mm -hmm. so we have uh, great pleasure in inviting Sudhir also. today a guru shishya combo and uh, definitely i think the combo is going to rock today and uh, so we welcome uh, sudhir i'll hand it over to him to introduce our uh, star speaker today yeah sudhir uh, over to you thank you yes sir uh, thanks a lot uh, sir for your kind words at the outset i would like to thank the uh, organizing committee uh, and the education committee of tnoa you know, uh, the president secretary professor singara vidivelu professor vetwel chelian sir professor tirunarayanan sir professor suresh kumar and professor tanapan for giving me this opportunity uh, to moderate today's program so actually it is uh, indeed a great initiative uh, by our parent body to provide such a platform uh, basically to enrich the knowledge of our project post graduates and i am honored to be a part of this sir so coming to today's topic uh, we all know that today's topic will be uh, tuberculosis of spine and as you all know tb is an endemic disease in our country and uh, tb spine is one of the most common pathologies that we come across in our day to day practice and uh, even as post graduates uh, it is very important to know in and out about tb spine and if you have a case of tb spine in your institute at the time of your exam you can be rest assured that it will be kept as a uh, as an exam case preferably as a long case and even for theory exam you all know that you will get at least one or two <laughs> questions from uh, tb spine so now about the speaker of today's program it is uh, none other than dr rajay prasad uh, shetty sir as tirunarayanan sir said he is my guru though he needs no introduction in the orthopedic and spine fraternity i think it is my duty to introduce him he is uh, senior consultant spine surgeon in ganga hospital coimbatore and the secretary of association of spine surgeons of india and he is one of the very few spine surgeons in the country who has a vast experience in almost all spinal pathologies and my bond actually with him dates back to 2007 uh, when i joined as a post graduate under him and since then he has been a great mentor and a perfect role model for me not only in orthopedics and spine as well as uh, during each and every milestone of my uh, career and life i have learned so many things from him actually and uh, one of the most important things which i learned from him is how to take care of your post graduates and that knowledge one shared keeps growing he shares whatever he knows and he makes sure that he keeps on sharing it irrespective of the time irrespective whether he is in ot or op so we used to admire that a lot and uh, thank you sir and i'm sorry sir i know that you don't like wasting time so i request you to take over uh, and i also request all the delegates to be interactive because uh, uh, you know like we are in front of a giant so it is the best platform for you to post all your doubts and queries and to get cleared and you can post your doubts and uh, queries in the chat box and i'll be moderating the same so thank you sir and uh, over to you sir uh thank uh, th good evening everybody my sincere thanks to the tnoa president secretary and especially to dr tirunarayan for having me here is actually my pleasure to be a part of a tnoa pg teaching program and uh, uh, thank you sudhir sudhir for your kind introduction of me i think i'll start sharing the screen now yes sir today's topic will be of uh, tuberculosis of the spine as you are all well aware the tuberculosis is one of the important uh, uh, things what you need should know as a post graduate because it's one of the commonest problems what we see especially in spine infectious problem you see in spine and uh, one of the commonest thing that could be asked for a post graduate if there is a case or during theory or any aspect of your evaluation x-rays or any aspect of your uh, exams 
Tuberculosis, as you know, is one of the oldest recognized disease of mankind, mankind. And it has been reported in Egyptian mummies, in uh, Rig Veda, and it has been called the White Plague in Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. Tuberculosis of the spine is one of the most commonest uh, part of the body that is being affected. A skeletal tuberculosis is uh, tuberculosis of the spine is one of the most commonest skeletal tuberculosis and can affect the spine from every, anywhere from the C1 down to the lumbosacral junction. It can present in many different ways and it is a great mimicker and a knowledge of tuberculosis is very essential for us, uh, especially as orthopedic surgeons, because it's one of the commonest conditions we see in our day-to-day -day practice. Why tuberculosis is important is because it's an important communicable disease and the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the developing world. If you look at the mortality that is caused by COVID, it is negligible when compared to the yearly mortality, what tuberculosis is causing uh, worldwide. The mortality is not because of tuberculosis of the spine, it's basically because of the tuberculosis of the lung. Sorry, there's some problem with the moment. The slides are not moving. The other reason why tuberculosis is important is because it's a curable disease. Therefore, it's a better knowledge of tuberculosis is very important because if you treat the patients appropriately, it can be completely cured and diagnosing tuberculosis very early can be without any consequences. To introduce, the spine is the most common site for skeletal tuberculosis. Amounts to about greater than 50% of skeletal tuberculosis is caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's one of the commonest thing that is asked is that why it affects commonly the lower thoracic or the thoracolumbar spine. It's basically because of the high vascularity of the virtual marrow at that level. The proximity to the structures such as cystine and chile, kidneys, lungs and the lymph nodes. This makes it thoracolumbar spine easily susceptible to a tubercular infections. If you look at the epidemiology, the most commonly affected countries are basically from Asia and from Africa. And a majority of the new cases, whichever that comes, are basically coming from this region. The importance is also there is an increased incidence of drug resistance in tuberculosis. But if you look at the statistics in southern India, the incidence of drug resistance is less than 5%. Whereas in northern India, if you see the articles that is written, most of them published from Mumbai or from the north, the reported incidence of drug resistance is significantly higher. It's probably uh, related to the fact that people down south are more compliant. Doctors also are more uh, uh, forceful in, in ensuring that the patients are more compliant in taking the drugs. This, is, this picture shows the high burden countries. And as you can see, most of them are in the Asia, Africa, and also some part of South America. What is also important is the fact that the HIV TB is endemic. I mean, if you see India is also a part where we have a tuberculosis, HIV and a MDR tuberculosis. The combination of a patient having both HIV and TB, it's called a HIV TB syndemic. And that also alters the management of these particular conditions. It's a global burden. It, it used to be present mainly in the developing world, but recently there have been an increased incidence in the gradual increase in the incidence of tuberculosis in the developing world, mainly because of increase in HIV and immunodeficiency status, and also because of immigration of uh, people from all these developing nations to the developed world. We do know that the mycobacterium tuberculosis is a unique acid fast bacteria. It's also, uh, it is a gram positive aerobic bacterium, first dis, uh, identified by Robert Koch, and hence tuberculosis is also known as a Cox disease or a Cox spine. What's unique about tuberculosis bacilli? The unique feature of tuberculosis bacilli is basically it has got a cord factor that is glycolipid in the cell wall, and this inhibits phagocytosis. There is an increased lipid content in the cell wall, which makes it resistant to antibiotics. And the mycolic acid makes it persistent and to resistant to free radicals. And that's why this bacteria tends to be remaining dormant or latent for a longer duration of time. It's a slow growing and can grow intermittently and remain dormant. That's one of the unique features. Therefore, it can be dormant. Therefore, 
all of us could have latent tuberculosis, whether tuberculous bacilli can be inside our body, but we do not have any manifestation. Due to some reasons, or whenever the immunity comes down, the bacteria might get reactivated, and there is a chance that we can have a disease or manifesting uh, because of tuberculous bacilli. The, the other major difference when spinal TB, when you compare to the pulmonary tuberculosis, uh, is the fact that uh, pulmonary tuberculosis is multibacillary. Therefore, usually you get a sputum positivity in an open case, whereas spinal tuberculosis is positivacillary. Therefore, when you do a biopsy, the diagnostic yield in spinal tuberculosis is relatively lesser. Most of the literature report to about 50 to 60 percent of the patients can have a culture positivity. And in microscopic examination, the positivity rate is even lesser. And other characteristic feature of this uh, tubercular bacilli, it survives both in the intracellular and extracellular milieu. Therefore, we need a multi-drug therapy to act on this particular bacteria. Pathophysiology starts with the infection from a hematogenous dissemination from a primary focus. It can also spread via the Bastens paravertebral venous flexus and lymphatic drainage from a paraaortic lymph nodes. We know the classical tuberculosis, the microscopic appearance is the presence of a tubercle. The tubercle bacilli are phagocytized by the macrophages forming epithelioid cells and these epithelial cells join together to form the Langren's Jain cells. And caseation necrosis happens because of the proteolytic enzymes, which are being released by the tuberculous bacilli. And this typical lesion is called the tubercle. The caseating necrosis, epithelial cells, Langren's Jain cell, are the three histological hallmark features of tuberculosis. Therefore, to diagnose tuberculosis, biopsy is one of the most important things. And the second important thing to diagnose confirmed tuberculosis is a positive TB culture. What happens usually because we do know that the vertebral blood supply, the, the lower half of the vertebra and the upper half of the vertebra and the, is supplied by a single artery. Therefore, usually the paradiscal type of tuberculosis is most common. The disc in, gets involved initially because of loss of nutrition and because of its avascular structure. This leads to a progressive dis destruction of the vertebral end plates on both sides of the disc, along with the collapse of the disc space. And that's the classical paradiscal involvement in spinal tuberculosis. What happens after that? There's a progressive destruction by tuberculous bacilli, leads to destruction, that is osteolysis, osteoporosis, and osteonecrosis, which will lead to the vertebral body collapse and also the collapse of the disc space because of loss of nutrition. And this Further, if untreated, can cause local kyphosis, collapse of the vertebral body, retropulsion of the bone, and abscess, leading on to a spinal cord compression and neurological deficit. Therefore, the initial problem in tuberculosis pathophysiology is the osteolysis, or the progressive destruction of the bone, which consequently causes collapse, which consequently causes an increase in kyphosis, retropulsion, instability, abscess formation, causing a neurological deficit. There are various patterns of spinal tubercular infections. This is one of the other common questions that is asked. One is the paradiscal, which is due to the arterial spread, the most commonest type. The next is the central type that is basically involving the vertebral body. The disc spaces are normal. It is supposed to be due to the venous spread. Anterior is basically due to the superiosteal spread and appendicular is the posterior element uh, type of tuberculosis. Earlier, you might uh, remember a term which if you read Thule's uh, books, you will understand that there is a condition called as a spinal tumor, tum uh, spinal tumor syndrome. It used to be one of the presentations in the era before the MRI was to be used. That means x-ray wise there is no major bony destruction. Whenever there is a posterior appendical tuberculosis or an epidural abscess because of tuberculosis, the patient used to present with neurological deficit in the absence of any major bony destruction. That used to be known as a spinal tumor syndrome. But with the use of MRI, we don't use that terminology that much common nowadays. <clears throat> this is what a pictorial representation. This is the paradiscal. The next one is the central type, anterior type, and the appendicular type of tuberculosis. Again, an MRI picture shows, showing the classical paradiscal involvement. Centrum 
which basically causes complete collapse of the vertebral body. The disc space is being normal. Posterior is very, very rare, relatively. And the anterior is basically very rarely to see. It's a part of the whole body that is involved. Along with that, there is an erosion of the anterior aspect, mainly because of its proximity to the aorta. Since tuberculosis is an anterior disease, kyphosis is usually the end result because healing has to ha happen by collapse and contact. And therefore, kyphosis is usually the end result. It depends on how much degree of kyphosis you get, depends upon when do you diagnose the condition. If tuberculosis is diagnosed very early in the disease, then with proper anti-tuberculosis drugs, the bone destruction can be stopped and the kyphosis that eventually happens is very less. But if the patient present to us late, or we free diagnose the condition late, the amount of kyphosis that is bound to happen becomes significantly more as shown in this particular example. This is a patient with a treated tuberculosis. You can see there is a collapse, but gradually they tend to fuse together. But if you don't treat a neglected tuberculosis, especially as a consequence of childhood spinal tuberculosis, leads to a horrendous deformity. And this is a classical example the child was diagnosed to have tuberculosis of the spine. Unfortunately, they didn't take adequate treatment and the patient went on, presented later with a significant collapse and a buckling type of collapse. This is a classical spine at risk sign, which I'm going to discuss later on. Therefore, what are the classical clinical features? The patient usually presents with the axial pain, uh, which is the most commonest type in tuberculosis. It could be a non-specific, a chronic inflammation type of nagging pain. It could be due to a pressure of the abscess. It could be because of segmental instability where the, there is severe pain. And they can have a classical night cries, what we see in tuberculosis of the hip, with sudden exacerbations in the night. Constitution symptoms like loss of weight, appetite, could be present in about 30 to 50 percent and is not absolutely necessary. Constitution symptoms are much more commoner in patients who are immunocompromised. They can present with paravertebral abscess, or they can present with a deformity or neurological deficit. But most common presentation is the axial pain, which could be associated with either one of the four below. Constitution symptoms, paravertebral abscess, kyphosis, and neurological deficit. And this is your classical presentation. Tuberculosis, we know, is a systemic disease. There could be coexistent disease in the lungs. They can present with open tuberculosis. There could be multiple skip lesions in tuberculosis, which could be as high as 10 to 15 to 20 percent. Therefore, when you get an MRI, whole spine screening is also mandatory. The next important thing you would like to know is basically the cold abscess. Cold abscess is formed by the collection of products of liquefaction and a reactive exudation, composed of mainly serum, leukocytes, caseous material, bone debris, and tuberculous bacilli. Sometimes it can burst to form sinus. In the era before the anti-tuberculous drug, cold abscess used to be a major problem. But with proper anti-tuberculous chemotherapy, there is absolutely no need to aspirate the cold abscess unless there is a significant uh, pressure effect, unless there is a significant pressure effect usually the med medicine will take care of the problem. How does cold abscess spread? That is one of the most commonest questions that is asked. It can spread in the anatomical planes. It can spread along vessels and nerves. It can spread through the natural orifices, the VOA, that the voice of America, that is the vein, aorta, and the esophagus, that is the orifices in the diaphragm, or through the medial and lateral arcuate ligaments. Sorry about the spelling. Therefore, in the cervical spine, the cold abscess, if there is a cervical spine cold abscess, it can spread to the anterior triangle, it can spread to the posterior triangle, it can spread along the vessels into the axilla or in, even into the arm, or it can spread along the posterior aspect. In the cervical thoracic region, it can spread to the mediastinum or the anterior chest wall. But what is important is the dorsal lumbar junction, where it can spread either are the dorsal and the dorsal lumbar junction. It can present as an anterior abdominal wall. It can present as a sewers abscess. It can present as an abscess in the lumbar triangle or the pettis triangle. 
it can track down along the nose and can present in the popliteal fossa. As I mentioned again, to repeat, in the cervical region, the abscess can spread behind the prevertebral fascia, along the sternocleidomastoid, in the anterior triangle or in the posterior triangle. It can spread towards the mediastinum. Therefore, patient can present with dysphonia or a dyspnea or dysphagia problems. In the thoracic region, it can posteriorly spread basically into the epidural and the paraspinal abscess. Laterally, it can be extra pleural or a mediastinal abscess. But what is important, you have to know because examiner commonly asks, how does the thoracic cold abscess spread? It can spread laterally along the intercostal. It can present as a chest wall abscess. But if it is spreading along the lower intercostal, it can present as an abdominal wall abscess. It can spread to the abdomen and the loin, presenting as a lumbar abscess. It is basically through the diaphragmatic orifices, the arcuate ligament, and through the sewer sheath. If you see the diaphragm has got an opening for the vena cava, esophagus, and the iota at the level of T8, T10, and T12. Along these orifices also, the cold abscess can track down from the thoracic vertebra down to the abdominal level, or also along the median and the lateral arcuate ligament, lateral crust of the diaphragm, the cold abscess can drain along that and can present on the posterior abdominal wall and also as a petit triangle. In the lumbar region, basically along the schwa sheath, iliac crest, along the femoral vessels to the femoral triangle, along the gluteal vessels to the gluteal region, and in the back in the petis triangle. It's very, very important for you to know about these cold abscess and how does it spread because it's one of the commonest questions that could be asked whenever you are discussing a patient or discussing an x-ray. Coming to the deformity, kyphosis is, uh, as I mentioned, is the end result. Again, in tuberculosis, but now you have a kyphosis. It's commonly asked, how do you classify kyphosis? A single vertebral body lesion is called, a vertebral body is destroyed. You get a kyphos. It is called as a knuckle deformity. When you've got two or more, two or three adjacent vertebral bodies involved, it is called a gibbous. And multiple adjacent vertebral bodies is involved, it causes a round kyphosis. The classical example of a round kyphosis will be Schurman's disease, ankylosing spondylitis, or a multiple osteoporotic compression fracture in a very elderly patient, what is called as a Dawagas hum. Therefore, knuckle and gibbous are common in tuberculosis, whereas a rounded kyphosis is not a usual common thing what you see in tuberculosis. Coming to the deformity in tuberculosis of the spine, 15% of all patients treated conservatively are known to end up with deformity. Out of them, 3 to 5% end up with more than 60 degrees of deformity. And most of these are because as a result of childhood spinal tuberculosis. Because in adults, once the disease heals, the deformity does not progress. Whereas in children, the disease can progress or the deformity can progress even after the disease is healed. It can either worsen, it can remain static, or it can improve. Therefore, because of the growth potential, it depends upon how much of the vertebral end plate is damaged, how much the facet joint is dislocated. Based on that, there is a varied progression of deformity even after healing in childhood spinal tuberculosis. Can we predict or prevent that? Yes, by looking at risk factors. Basically, it's a consequence of childhood spinal tuberculosis. Whenever a child who is aged less than 10 years Whenever they have a vertebral body loss of greater than 1 to 1.5, and before you start treatment, if the deformity is greater than 30 degrees, junctional lesions, and the presence of spine at risk signs usually indicate that these children, if you treat them conservatively, the chances that deformity progresses to a very severe degree is significantly higher. Therefore, it's important to identify them. What are spine at risk signs? Basically, there are signs which are seen during the active disease, which predict that if you treat them conservatively, there is a high chance of developing significant deformity in the uh, consequence of the uh, disease process. Basically, what you are looking for is a facial dislocation, which may not be that appreciable in the X-ray. We need to have a CT scan. If there is a retropulsion, if there is a lateral translation, or a toppling over of one vertebra over the other. 
these are what are called at the spina tristans as i shown this is a classical example therefore deformity in tuberculosis during active disease is easily correctable whereas in a heel disease is rigid and needs an osteotomy coming to the other important aspect is neurological deficit it can happen in between 20 to 30% of the patient and neurological deficit can happen both during the active and the late stages of the disease therefore when you have about a patient with a neurological deficit during the examination the most commonest thing examiner will ask you you got a gibbous in the back tell me what is the vertebral level therefore we know that the angle of the scapula corresponds to t3 or t4 the the spine of the scapula sorry the angle of the scapula corresponds to t7 the highest point of the iliac crest corresponds to l4 the other common thing is that if you see uh, indian men or women indian men who wear dhotis and indian women who wear sarees they usually have a groove around where they tie their waist which usually corresponds to l3 vertebra and the dimple of venus venus corresponds to the s2 vertebra and therefore if you have got a lesion somewhere between the spine of the scapula and the angle of the scapula you can presume that the probably it is at t5 okay and if you got a lesion somewhere between t7 to l4 therefore you can presume it is between somewhere therefore the vertebral level understanding is very very important the second important thing you have to understand is the relationship between the vertebra and the spinal cord therefore this is very very important to identify the cord level that means like for example you have a sensory loss below the level of umbilicus we know that umbilicus corresponds to the t10 level like for example the nipple corresponds to and anteriorly the nipple corresponds to the sensory level of t4 the zygomatic sternum corresponds to t7 the umbilicus corresponds to t10 and the groin corresponds to l1 therefore if you have a sensory level as an umbilicus that is at the level of t10 therefore we know that our vertebral level will be at least three levels above that means at the level of t9 i will explain that again in the cervical spine for the vertebral level the cord level you have to add one for t1 to t6 vertebra you have to add two for t7 to t9 vertebra you have to add three therefore if there is a sensory loss at t12 that means the vertebral level is t9 t10 vertebra corresponds to the cord level of l1 l2 t11 vertebra corresponds to the cord level of l3 4 t12 vertebra corresponds to l5 and l1 corresponds to s1 to s4 and this is very very important whenever you are doing a examination of the spine the vertebral level and the motor or a spinal cord level also important in the examination is kumar staging of neurological deficit we, even though we do not use it regularly nowadays we basically go by uh, standard uh, asia neurological grading but you have to know as a postgraduate student you have, it is predominantly based on motor deficits it is one is negligible where patient is unaware there is only hyperreflexia two is mild patient is aware but manage, manages to walk with support three is moderate there is a non ambulatory there is paralysis in extension whereas type 4 is severe with the paralysis in flexion it is just of historical importance but you might be asked about it in the examination coming to the next important aspect of tuberculous paraplegia you have to know the sudden classification which is classified into early onset and late onset early onset is because of infectious process abscess inflammation dislodged sequestrum and instability whereas late onset is when the tuberculosis has healed as a consequence of childhood spinal tuberculosis when the deformity becomes more there is stretching of the spinal cord over a bony ridge but the classification that is preferred is that is the one by horson et al which is classifying paraplegia into paraplegia of active disease and the paraplegy of the heel disease therefore even late onset could be a reactivation of a tuberculosis the prognosis is better whereas paraplegy of the heel disease the prognosis is relatively very poor this is what i meant in the active disease is either because of the retroposition of the bone it could be because of the abscess it could be because of instability 
but since it's an acute process, the recovery is usually very good. Whereas in the late onset tuberculosis, the spinal cord gets stretched over the deformity and like a rope which is getting stretched over a sharp object or any object, it gets torn out over a period of time. The spinal cord also undergoes damage and which is, which is not recoverable. Sudhir, I think we can discuss yes. any questions so far about this. Yes, sir. Uh, I have posted in the chat box. In the meantime, uh, on behalf of the postgraduates, I would like to uh, emphasize on a few points and ask few doubts to you, sir. Yeah, so, sure. You can as, summarize uh, and... Yeah. As uh, uh, Ajay has said, it is very important from history-wise, whenever you're getting a long case in tuberculosis spine, it is very, very important to have a proper history, like in any other examination. So... History, uh, starting from history, you have to know about the socioeconomic status of the patient. Most of the examiners will want you to comment about the socioeconomic status whenever they come across TB spine. Though uh, the previous thought of low socioeconomic status is commonly involved, it is not so nowadays, but they may expect. So that is one important point which I wanted to tell the PGs. And second thing in history, it is very, very important uh, to ask about history of cough. As sir pointed out, you have to elicit a proper history whether TB is affecting any other regions, especially whether there is history of pulmonary tuberculosis and contact history is very, very important. Most of the times in uh, haste, we may forget that history of contact with any family members or history of travel to any uh, other places which can uh, precipitate this. One another important uh, fact which I want to emphasize is spinal tumor syndrome. Sir, clearly explained about what is spinal tumor syndrome. It is given in the uh, old textbooks, especially Thule book, why it is called so. So I, I hope you all understood that concept. Uh, posterior type of TB, initially when MRI was not there, it used to present like uh, with deficit like tumor. So without any bony destruction, so they named it as spinal tumor syndrome because it mimicked uh, spinal tumors. Sir, uh, uh, one, one question uh, for clarification. Uh, you yeah. told that uh, spine, uh, the difference between vertebral level and cord level. Why is it so? Why are we adding levels? No, it's basically because the, the spinal cord, when, the, when a child is born, is at the low, at, at, up to the level of the L2, L3. And the growth of the spine and the growth of the cord is not in the same manner. The vertebral growth is much more when compared to the growth of the spinal cord. And therefore, there is always a disparity. Exactly, sir. So that's what you expected? Or, uh, sir? No, that's what you expected? Yes, sir. That's what I expected. They, uh, because when the examiner asked, they should uh, be able to say that because the spinal cord gets pulled up because the vertebral column grows down. So as I said, that is the reason why we are adding levels. So that is why there is discrepancy between uh, suppose if D910 lesion is there, the cord level will be different. So they, uh, that is the exact reason for that. And next thing, a cold abscess. Cold abscess is a very, very uh, important topic whenever spine TB is concerned. And uh, uh, you can be sure that there will be an exam question about cold abscess. I hope all the postgraduates understood about uh, the spread of cold abscess. So why it is called as cold abscess, sir? It's cold abscess is caused mainly because there is no signs of inflammation. Because usually when you say an abscess, it has got the usual signs of inflammation, Kailar, rubar, dilar, and pain. Whereas cold abscess, it doesn't have any signs of acute inflammation. Therefore, you see a swelling. Sometimes it could be painful because of the stretch. But when you don't see warmth, you don't see significant tenderness. And that's why it's called a cold abscess. Yes, sir. So I hope you all got the answer. So, and next to most important thing is, uh, coming to psoas abscess. So, psoas abscess is uh, one of the very uh, common clinical scenarios uh, which we see. So, uh, most of the patients with psoas abscess, they will present with flexion deformity of hip. So, whenever you are kept an exam case with a patient with flexion deformity of hip, and if the patient is complaining of pain in the back, so you have to be very, very careful. And uh, I, uh, just for the PG, sir, how do you differentiate between a hip pathology like flexion deformity of hip due to psoas abscess from a true hip pathology? Therefore, when you've got a hip flexion deformity, it could be a true hip flexion deformity or a pseudo hip flexion deformity. That's number one. And here, one word of caution, which may not be applicable for your exam, but is applicable in your day-to-day -day practice. 
if you see a boy with the pseudo hip flexion deformity be always sure that it's not a hemophilia hemophilic children can present first time or they might have a history of hemophilia but they will not tell you they can present with bleeding into the psoas muscle and present with a pseudo hip flexion deformity i'm telling this because if the radiologist reported ultrasound wise there is an abscess and you put a knife without being sure that he is hemophilic and you have the necessary uh, this thing ready you can lose the patient on table that's one and second thing how do you differentiate in a pseudo hip flexion deformity one moment you flex the hip to 90 degrees and rotate you get a full range of motion rotations are normal whereas we know that in any hip pathology the rotations are the first one which is most likely to be affected especially the internal rotation yes sir uh, so that, uh, that, that i wanted to stress that point uh, that's why i asked this question sir so in pseudo flexion deformity of hip due to psoas abscess the rotations will be normal so it is very very vital point uh, for the pgs to understand and in the history again uh, a treatment history is very very important the patient may have some kind of treatment history in the past you have to uh, probe for the history whether they were on treatment prolonged treatment with dots or with any phcs they may say they took for one month or two months and then they defaulted so that history is again very important there are few questions from uh, the delegate sir spinal yeah. risk change is it applicable only to pediatric spinal tuberculosis or in all age groups to assess deficit and deformity is usually you do not see spinal risk change that much in adult to spinal tuberculosis because uh, the the ligaments or capsules are much more uh, harder or more fibrotic whereas in children there is a ligament laxity the, the capsules tend to be more laxer it is mainly identifiable in children not that much useful in adults and uh, is it to assess deficit or de and deformity sir or it is only to prognosticate it is barely to predict that children with any one of this can have a bad deformity therefore what you have to do is you have to stabilize it thank you sir if you do not stabilize it you will end up even with conservative management end up with a very bad deformity basically spinal risk signs imply that the facet joint is dislocating we know that tuberculosis is an anti a disease and spine can be divided either into two column by dennis but most commonly what we use is a two column anterior column and the posterior column when you have got a anti a column disease which is which is significantly affecting and the facet tends to get dislocated that means the posterior column is getting affected that means both the anterior and the posterior column is affected you have to address them if not the deformity becomes significantly more yes sir so the biomechanics here is very very important so when there is anterior collapse usually it is para discal so when uh, both the bodies are getting involved and when it is collapsing obviously the posterior elements have to give way when the collapse is getting very severe so it, the first uh, most important step is facetal subluxation and facetal dislocation so that is the initiator of uh, the deformity so that is why it is important another question is why didn't the cold abscess show any signs of inflammation why doesn't it show any signs of inflammation <laughs> basically it doesn't have act, uh, acute inflammatory markers being present is basically from a necrosis which caseation that tends to happen and that caseation is basically a pus which is not an active inflammation which is happening around that area it comes from a bony origin or some organ and then it drains away it's basically a caseation which doesn't generate uh, warmth or heat yes sir and as you all know it is uh, predominantly tb is always accompanied by increase in lymphocytes rather than neutrophils so acute inflammation in any uh, for i mean in any uh, tuberculous abscess is quite less so that is one of the uh, another reasons last uh, two questions sir from my side for pgs so what is the significance of active paraplegia and late paraplegia or early onset paraplegia and delayed what is the significance of it the basic significance of active paraplegia is the fact that it is by an active disease and the the prognosis is very good uh, if you treat the patient adequately with stabilization decompression anti tuberculous chemotherapy the recovery rates are very very high whereas late onset paraplegia because if the spinal cord is stretched over an apex of a deformity for very long years the recovery and the prognosis for recovery is very poor yes sir 
so that point is very important uh, to note uh, so basically if you intervene at an early stage as sir pointed out in the first slide itself it is curable uh, with very good results so that is the significance of uh, those uh, last question for this part of the session is what you uh, mentioned about kumar staging system which is very important for the exam going pgs to know so what is paralysis and flexion and extension what is the difference why they have graded paralysis and flexion as grade 4 and extension as grade 3 Uh, you is better you explain. I don't use it, therefore I'm not very sure. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, paralysis in uh, flexion. I mean, it is uh, flaccid paralysis or pa paralysis and extension is very severe because the inhibitory signals also gets lost from the extra pyramidal tract. So it becomes a global disease affecting all the spinal cord tracts, involving the entire uh, spinal cord rather than uh, the inhibitory tracts, which is intact, which it can. the anti gravity muscles will act when partial fibers are present that is what uh, uh, i i read in a neurology book yeah yeah maybe that may be the reason so yes and one more question from the delegate spinal trisc sign applies only for tb not for trauma sir no because is there it needs a condition it is also we have noticed that it is also applicable for congenital deformities mucopolysaccharidosis it needs a chronic phase of growth to affect it therefore it's in acute trauma scenario you don't call it spinal tris you say there is a bicolumnar failure okay it's not something that it evolves over a period of time trauma is one time but here it's something that is evolves over a period of time okay sir okay As sir things stand today is applicable only for tuberculosis yes sir thank you sir uh, thanks for clearing the doubts yeah. sir we can go to the second part of the session so again you can post your doubts i will be helping you to clear the doubts with uh, sir yeah thank coming you coming to the second part of the question is the part of the talk is about diagnosis diagnosis is based on clinical features to a large extent it gives you a clue moment you somebody who has got who says he's got a loss of weight loss of appetite and then you notice there is a swelling in the back you might think of tuberculosis but at the same time you should it's a differential diagnosis like it could be a malignancy also therefore the important part of diagnosis is clinical features laboratory investigation microbiological investigation and the radiology comparatively you come to a clinical diagnosis once you are done all of them lab investigation there is lot of controversy in, in uh, as with regards to tuberculosis but what we should do regularly is hemoglobin because you are looking at the nutrition whether the hemoglobin is quite good or if the hemoglobin is low then you may have to that means is a nutritionally compromised individual esr is basically a marker of a uh, infection but not a acute infection a chronic infection it doesn't helps in diagnosis but it is helpful in prognosticating to a large extent if you got a esr about 80 to 100 and then when you start on therapy you see at follow up it slowly comes down to 20 30 it could be that means the patient is responding it's not a diagnostic one but it's basically helpful for to have a baseline therapeutic so that you can pro, uh, you can assess whether the patient is responding or not i didn't mention here is also important to look at albumin again for the nutrition reason a diabetic whether he is a diabetic or not immunocompromised status like hiv and lft is also important once you diagnose tuberculosis because we know that anti tuberculosis drugs most of them have got a chances of affecting the liver the side effect is a liver dysfunction therefore to have a baseline value is very very important none of these are specific for diagnosis but moment you diagnose a suspect a patient with tuberculosis especially after seeing the x rays and all that this is what we should do what we should not do is basically the blood pcrs antibody test tb gold test montu test especially is not advocated in an indian scenario montu might still be used uh, sometimes but all other tests should not be done because government of india way back in 2015 or 16 has said that the inaccurate serological test to diagnose tuberculosis should be banned and it is now government does not recommend these tests for to diagnose tuberculosis the igm igg okay you have to be very sure about that the blood pcr test is not advocated is only the tissue pcr which i am going to speak later that is the one we should do not the blood pcr there are two tests for latent tb one is a montu test or the tuberculin skin test and other is the interferon gamma release assay also called as tb gold test 
it basically identify whether a person is exposed to tuberculosis and in endemic area like india all of us would have exposed to tuberculosis some part in life therefore you might get a positive gold test or a positive montus test and it is very very useful in non endemic area in us somebody suspects to have a tuberculosis a tb gold test might indicate that this uh, that patient might be having an active disease because they don't have a endemic area the latent tuberculosis is not very common that's the important thing you have to understand there are some books which do mention that when you give a montu test if there is a significant necrosis when the size of the response is greater than 10 mm it could imply that the patient might be having an active disease you should have be aware of that i'm not very sure whether it is practically true i do not use any one of these tests uh, to diagnose tuberculosis but as a exam going student you should be aware of it it is useful in children less than 3 to 5 years of age because they do not go outside the house they are not exposed to the overall community a positive mantu test may be useful in them but in adults usually not very useful but if so it to be useful there should be a skin ulceration or a, a reaction which is more than 10 mm but the most important part of your diagnosis comes from radiology it could be plain radiographs it could be mri it could be ct scan in the early stage in a paradiscal lesion there could be vertebral vertebral osteoporosis but what is important is always the narrowing of the disc space in the classical paradiscal lesions there could be mild marginal erosions narrowing of the disc space and you can see the classical paravertebral abscesses i think it's called the bird's nest abscess which you might see in certain patients with cold abscess but you have to understand that we need radiographs always in ap and lateral view and it will take 3 to 6 weeks for you to find any subtle changes in the radiographs you also have to look not only for the bone but also for the soft tissue shadows in areas junctional areas like cervical thoracic and lumbosacral junction you definitely need to get a ct scan if the disease present late then the features are very classical because of destruction there will be kyphosis collapse erosions this is really what is called as the aneurysmal sign where there is an erosion is this tuberculosis body is affected by tuberculosis and because the aorta is constantly pulsating against the soft vertebra you may get an anterior erosion which is called the aneurysmal phenomenon again that could be a question regarding that ct scan is very useful to know the bone destruction very useful when you are planning treatment very useful in junctional areas where you can't be appreciating uh, with the plain radiograph but what is more important is the mri okay nowadays in spine the first investigation we do is always x ray and following x ray the next investigation what we do is always mri scan mri is the gold standard investigation of choice early stages there could be paradiscal involvement or vertebral body involvement decreased disc space presence of an abscess in the front but later stages you may get a huge abscess there could be cord compression therefore what are the classical features of tuberculosis of the spine a well defined para spinal abnormal signal involvement of para discal involvement that means adjacent vertebral body along with the intervening disc a thin smooth abscess wall a para spinal or intraosseous abscess when you find a cold abscess which is spread subligamentous over 3 to 4 levels multiple vertebral body involvement thoracic vertebral involvement they go more in favor of a tuberculosis rather than pyogenic you can see this is how the disease can extend from the front from the back there is destruction of the vertebral body it, there could be retropulsion of the vertebral body and other major advantage of the mri scan is also that we can identify multifocal lesions if you got a lesion in the cervical spine thoracic or lumbar spine you can identify them that's number one and number two uh number 2 also it can assess the healing of the lesions these are the various differences between pyogenic and tuberculous but as i mentioned if it's thoracic most commonly tubercular if it is lumbar it could be either tuberculous or pyogenic if it is elderly patient who gives history of urinary tract infection you may think of pyogenic and the most classical thing is that if you can see this picture the disc involvement is the first thing that happens in pyogenic whereas tuberculosis disc involvement happens 
late in the disease because of nutritional compromise, not because of uh, direct affection. And if you see a huge cold abscess, it always goes in favor of tuberculosis. This is an example of a pyogenic. You see here, the bone is relatively okay, but disc is very bright in the MRI, very suggestive of a pyogenic discitis. And MRI helps you to know whether the disease has healed, especially the fast separate image gives you an idea whether there's a lipid change that has happened in the virtual body. Coming to the next part, is biopsy necessary? Yes, it's always important to get a biopsy. There are certain situations when the patient does not agree, you can make a presumed diagnosis of tuberculosis and start. But tuberculosis is a great mimicker. It could be pyogenic, it could be eosinophilic granuloma, it could be lymphoma. And I had a patient who grew TB, TB bacteria, but didn't respond to the drug. And when over a period of follow-up, we diagnosed that the initial report was tuberculosis. But the second time when we operated, when the patient came with a recurrent paraplegia, the biopsy was reported as a lymphoma. Therefore, TB is a great mimicker. I show you an example, which I borrowed from my colleague, Dr. Ishii, a patient with an, uh, who presented to us with a bilateral weakness. And you see there are signal changes in the virtual body. There appears to be an epidural connection, but once on the table, we realized it's not an abscess, it's basically benign cavernous hemangioma. Therefore, tuberculosis can present in many ways. It's a great mimicker. Therefore, it's always important that you have to take a biopsy. If you've got a stable spine, at least part of the disease, you can do biopsy itself and treat the patient. But however, if you find a patient who comes to you with gross instability, neurological deficit, and you MRI-wise, it looks like tuberculosis, it's better to stabilize the vertebra and do biopsy at the same time because this patient cannot wait. And biopsy to take on an unstable spine, you might further compromise your outcome. The most important thing is that when you take a biopsy, always send for gene expert, TB culture, histopathology, pyogenic bacterial culture, always. If you are coming from an endemic area, fungal culture is better. Smear usually is not a very good option in uh, skeletal tuberculosis. As I mentioned, the spinal TB is possibly bacillary. The chances of getting spear positivity is very, very low. It's, it's an ideal choice for pulmonary tuberculosis. Therefore, I would say that you have to send these five tests. Gene expert, TB culture, histopathology, pyogenic bacterial culture, and a fungal culture. What is gene expert? Gene expert, okay, before that, biopsy from where? Ideally from the lesion. It could be image guided or a CT guided. It could be transpedicular. <coughs> or if you've got a cold abscess, you can aspirate the cold abscess and send it for a gene expert or a TB culture. And if you are quite a gene expert positive, then you can start the patient on antitubical chemotherapy. If you've got a situation like this, it's very easy for you to aspirate, confirm the gene expert is positive and start the patient on antitubical chemotherapy, provided the spine is relatively stable. There are a few terminologies we should remember, which is now given by the government of India, the RNTCP index guidelines. A presumptive case is a patient with symptoms and signs of extrapulmonary tuberculosis who needs to be investigated. Okay, after the x-ray, everything you see, you think is tuberculosis, is a presumed TB. A bacteriologically confirmed case is when you do a PCR-based test like a gene expert or a positive microscopy, then it is a bacteriologically confirmed case. A clinically diagnosed case is sometimes, even if you do the biopsy, it comes as nonspecific, but your clinical suspicion based on x-rays and MRI is very high, then it's a clinically diagnosed case. And now, as per the RNTCP, if you have a clinically suspected patient, <coughs> even though it's bacteriologically negative, there's not, they, you have a reason to put the patient on a trial of conservative therapy, of anti-tuberculous therapy, to see whether it's going to respond or not. So again, there are two more. One, clinically diagnosed treatment failure. That means you're given the drug properly, but you find that the imaging keeps showing worsening of the scenario after around four to six months, there is a clinically diagnosed treatment failure. Bacteriologically confirmed treatment failure is when you do a repeat biopsy, you send for culture, culture comes a drug resistant tuberculosis, then only it's a bacteriologically confirmed treatment failure. Please remember these five terminologies. 
which might be useful sometimes. Uh, Sudhir, this is about the investigation. I didn't speak much about gene expert. Yes, sir. Okay, okay sir. So, <clears throat> any doubts, you can uh, uh, just post it in the chat box. In the meantime, I'll ask a few questions uh, to sir on uh, behalf of you all. So, uh, in the meantime, I would just uh, like to, I, I would like to emphasize the fact about a few points about clinical examination. Whenever you are uh, being kept a long case in TB spine, usually it will be TB uh, with paraplegia or paraparesis. In those conditions, uh, definitely you have to do a proper uh, neurological examination, upper limbs, lower limbs, everything, and you have to document. Usually, as sir said, TB will involve the thoracic or thoracolumbar junction. Uh, usually, the patient will have human signs whenever the patient is presenting to you with paraplegia. So, you will have exaggerated reflexes, clonus. So, usually in exams, they will keep you a classical case of TB spine with paraparesis. Uh, so, you will have all these human signs, so you have to clearly uh, examine all those things. Uh, and uh, coming to x-rays, uh, Sir mentioned about uh, uh, x-rays. So, whenever, I mean, the commonly asked question is, when do you see the first change in the x-ray? So, when uh, is the, usually when the lysis is about 30 to 40 percent, or when the 30 to 40 percent of the bone is destroyed, you will see the initial changes in x-ray. And uh, sir mentioned that disc space atrophy is one of the earliest signs in X-ray. Why is that so, sir? Disc is avascular, and you said disc is not involved. The nutrition, the nutrition of the disc comes from the vertebral body. Yes. Therefore, whenever there is a disease that affects the vertebral body, the nutritional pathway to the disc is affected, and that's why naturally they start to collapse. Yes. Uh, so that is very very important. The disc receives its nutritional supply through the end plate from the vertebral body. It is a vascular structure and a neural structure except for the outer layers. So when the paradiscal region is involved, there will be loss of nutrition from the body to the disc. So the disc atrophies, okay? And uh, difference between, sir, sorry if I am dragging just for- No, no. Collecting, I'm noting down the exam question. So difference between tuberculosis and phyogenic, sir, so a clear table that is very, very important. It is uh, very important to buy heart the table. And one point to add from the table, history-wise, whenever uh, a patient is toxic with acute onset of symptoms, with a, a continuous fever and severe pain, those favor more in terms of pyogenic. TB is usually an insidious or subacute onset with evening rise of temperature with the constitutional symptoms will be relatively mild. But pyogenic usually will be acute and the patient will be toxic on examination-wise. So, any other points to add on that, sir, history-wise between TB and pyogenic? No, that should be okay. I mean, uh, basically, the acuteness of onset, the shorter duration of history, yes, sir. Uh, severe constitutional symptoms, severe pain, yes, sir, uh, could go in favor of uh, pyogenic. And an elderly patient with history of urinary tract infection, some infection focus earlier on, may go in favor of pyogenic. Yeah, that is very, very vital point. Uh, any UTA or any other foci of infection, history-wise, you have to ask that whether the patient took tablets for any other infection. And a uh, few questions from the delegates. So, CT-guided biopsy, how reliable it is? It's quite reliable, but provided uh, on the effic efficiency of the radiologist, interventional radiologist. See, basically, your CT-guided biopsy is actually much more accurate than a CM guided biopsy because you are putting the needle in an area where the lesion is very seen. Because in the CM, you see in two planes, whereas in a CT scan, you see in all uh, directions, both sagittal and axial. But it depends upon the skill of the interventional radiologist. Yes. Uh, next question is how to differentiate between TB and secondaries in MRI? That's a very good question. Uh, for, uh... The most important thing you have to understand is that the main differentiation between TB and uh, secondaries, it, it happens only in a central type of tuberculosis. In a paradiscal type of tuberculosis, there is always an involvement of the disc space. In the metastasis, usually in the secondaries, disc space is not involved. We know that the secondaries usually affects the part of the pedicle and the posterior part of the vertebral body because there is a red bone marrow. That's number one. Number two, the involvement of the vertebral body is complete and homogeneous. And also there is a convex posterior vertebral body. 
if you see the mri scan of a patient with metastasis there will be a convexity of the posterior part of the vertebral body because of the tumor that is a very important hallmark of a tumor absence of an abscess if there is the presence of an abscess which is going up and down goes more in favor of tuberculosis there is no abscess only a destruction of the vertebra posterior ballooning or a posterior convexity of the vertebral body destruction of the pedicle unilateral especially goes in more favor because we know that red bone marrow is situated there more goes more in favor of metastasis yes, thanks a lot sir so the vital points uh, ballooning of posterior cortex is very important intact uh, disc space in metastasis and involvement of the posterior elements like pedicle is very commonly seen in metastasis and uh, usually abscess will be absent in metastasis so these are the four or five points so can we start treatment for tuberculosis when gene expert culture biopsy i mean everything is negative and biopsy says chronic inflammatory disease yeah that you can start now the government of india has said that is a clinically diagnosed case Yes. A patient with a negative microbiological test for tuberculosis, but with a strong clinical suspicion and compatible imaging findings. Yes. And these so, patients, you can start on a trial of conservative therapy with anti-tuberculous drugs and look for the response. Over a period of six weeks to two months, you find that the patient is clinically responding with relief of pain, improvement in appetite, weight gain. Then you can continue the same. and uh, again the same question uh, by another one uh, by another delegate uh, management in case of inconclusive pathology uh, we have uh, discussed that yeah. so mycobacteria culture will do it regularly sir it takes long time from one of the delegates yeah definitely as yes. you have to do microbiological culture unfortunately tuberculosis be tuberculosis of the spine being a possible secondary disease culture positivity rate varies between about 40 to 50% to 60% but the advantage is that if you get a culture positive you will be able to do the sensitivity we know then and there itself whether it is sensitive to first line drugs or whether it is a resistant tuberculosis gene expert gives you resistance only to rifampicin okay it's a very good test but however a final thing is if you are able to get a culture positive yes sir uh, so the same thing uh, sir what is backtech and what do you have to say about backtech Yep. Bacter culture medium is the current medium that is being used. Earlier, it was the LJ medium, Lewiston Johnson's medium, which used to take much longer time, about six weeks to eight weeks. Whereas the current medium, what is used for tuberculous bacilli, is the Bacter medium, which take around four weeks, three to four weeks, for the culture to grow. How, what is the time duration to get gene expert results, sir? It's usually within twenty-four to forty-eight hours. So usually, you get the result within twenty-four to twenty-four hours. Uh, yeah, uh, by gene expert. and uh, what is the other test sir which shows uh, which uh, has sensitivity uh, to both isoniazid and rifampicin which tests the latest uh, it's very not available in the indian market i'm not very sure about that it's okay, called no. the gene expert ultra or something like that i don't know whether it's available in india market at least not available in coimbatore okay uh, so any few words about uh, yeah gene expert you discussed so what is incidence of bladder involvement and its prognosis in tb spine by dr thiru see the importance of bladder involvement is see if you see the literature in tuberculosis if you see the quotations going on i mean some people will say neurological involvement up to 60% there are papers which say neurological involvement of up to 20% it's very difficult to exactly say what is the percentage right now because we are not do not have a proper statistics literature wise it could be as about 20% of the patient with bladder involvement what is the prognosis usually it depends upon the associated motor condition in tuberculosis if the neurological deficit is incomplete they usually tend to recover without any major issues number one number two if they are anger incomplete they present to us earlier and the neurological deficit is basically mainly because of a cold abscess not because of a bony subluxation or a dislocated bone if the patient is elderly who come to us late the recovery is relatively lesser and with a severe uh, neurology okay sir uh, last two more questions sir uh, will it okay is it necessary to rule out spinal tb in patients who are diagnosed with tb of other sites sir not absolutely necessary if you got a proven pulmonary tuberculosis 
and patient has got a radiological features which are in favor of tuberculosis and there is no major destruction you don't need to intervene you continue the tb drugs and observe the patient it's very uncommon to have a combination of two pathologies but i have seen quite a few but doesn't mean that you have to do a biopsy every time and uh, is drug sensitivity checking mandatory in all the patients is it necessary in all patients see that's the problem only if the culture grows you can do a drug sensitivity testing only way you can test is gene expert if you get a gene expert positive you test rifampicin that usually if rifampicin is sensitive that implies the first line drug is probably sensitive okay sir it's always uh, mandatory if you ask me it's mandatory if you it's always better if, if you do a biopsy you have to do it okay sir uh from professor tanapan how to clinically differentiate between paraplegia and flexion and paraplegia and extension for post graduate sake how to clinically sir <laughs> you have to tell uh, uh sir uh, clinically uh, when you examine the patient usually paraplegia and flexion they will be having spasticity of both the lower limbs that is grade 3 so uh, the paraplegia and flexion means the anti gravity muscles will be working there will be spasticity so there are uh, the tone in the muscles will be increased so if you check for the anti gravity muscles there will be in a state of uh, spasm whereas in paraplegia and extension it will usually be a complete flaccid paralysis and uh, all the i mean both the lower limbs of, both the lower limbs of, are involved it will be in complete extension so that is why they have mentioned it as paraplegia and extension so that is the significance sir i just want to add one point about gene expert for the pg sake gene expert so you may get this as a recent advance in the recent yes. advances paper it is otherwise called as cb nat test so uh, cb nat uh, it, it is called as uh, nucleic acid amplification uh, test so that is important and the other test uh, which is commonly used is the lpa it is basically uh, lpa test is to identify the res resistance for isoniazid as well as incompetence sir pointed out no 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 sudeep lpa is line probe assay line probe assay yeah line probe assay can be done only if there is a culture positivity yes sir you cannot do lpa on tissues on a tissue sample currently available is only see basically this comes under the group what is called as molecular diagnostics as a exam going student it can come as a short notice uh, short notes molecular diagnostics need not apply only for uh, tuberculosis like gene expert it can be applicable for other bacterial infection also currently people are using molecular diagnostics to get early culture sensitivity pattern even in other scenarios lpa is useful only in a patient who has got a tb culture positive yeah that is line probe assay where you can get the culture sensitivity report within 4 to 5 days correct exactly sir so whenever there is a tb culture positive it is basically a reverse hybridization method of dna to identify uh, tb bacilli and actually you can identify resistance to both rifampicin and isoniazid so uh, it is uh, that is called as lpa or line probe assay so it may come to you i mean come in the exams in the recent advances so it is from culture positive specimen that is very very important yes sir so we can okay. proceed with the uh, yeah. uh, one last question sir how to grade the power of muscle in paraparesis with spasticity it's quite a difficult question to answer because uh it depends upon the degree of spasticity the individual has got sometimes the spasticity is ash with grade 4 it becomes very difficult to assess the power it's very difficult to say whether it's a power or is because of the spasticity or if they have got a clonus it becomes very very difficult to assess there are ways where people describe but in my experience i don't give much importance to that so in exam if you are asked if you have a, this is a classical scenario this is a very very important question the patient will be having spasticity most of the times you can politely tell the examiner that the patient has spasticity and based on modified ashworth grading system you can grade the spasticity after that when you are asked to comment about power you can politely say so the patient is having spasticity so i am unable to comment about the power uh, clearly sir if the examiner persists okay you tell me what is the power then you can go ahead and uh, comment in the clinical exam but for uh, other other purposes as sir said whenever there is spasticity ideally speaking you are not supposed to uh, comment on the power of the muscle as per uh, neurologists and neurological examination but in exams when you are asked you can say the patient has spasticity and you can go ahead with 
commenting on the power yes sir i think we are done and uh, we okay. can go ahead with management sir yeah coming to the management which is the next important aspect because here also there is one more thing about tuberculosis you should know In india now tuberculosis is a notifiable disease therefore moment you see a patient with tuberculosis as you we have to inform the government <laughs> the regional tuberculosis center that that we have got a patient with tuberculosis and we are starting on therapy that's also by law you are 100% have to notify it coming to the medical management anti tuberculosis chemotherapy should be started in all patients once the diagnosis is confirmed and it is the mainstay in the management of spinal tuberculosis professor moon has said the tuberculosis of the spine is a medical disease if you diagnose early tuberculosis of the spine the only thing that is necessary to be done is a good adequate anti tuberculosis chemotherapy what is the basic principles of medical management number 1 multi drug therapy number 2 inten- there are two phases intensive phase of 2 months and a continuation phase of 10 months overall duration is 12 months and it's a daily therapy like you have to be very sure about all this this is the index tb guidelines from the government of india currently in 2000 uh, 2020 okay that's number 1 is the fact that dots therapy i mean uh, weekly twice the dots therapy is no more used now it's a daily therapy even if it's the dots therapy directly observed treatment strategy the therapy is daily number 1 number 2 the minimum duration is for 12 months in some situation you can extend up to 18 months but ideally what is the duration of therapy the government of india's recommendation 2 months of intensive phase and 10 months of continuation phase therefore i explained to you already as to why it should be a multi drug therapy because the one is the bacteria could be intracellular and extracellular and these multiple drugs acts on different parts of the bacteria it was some acts on the cell wall synthesis some acts on energy metabolism some acts on replication and transcription therefore we need and it's a slow growing bacteria therefore we need a multi drug therapy to in tuberculosis the rationale for the long duration and phases because tb organism may be rapid replicators to dormant that is persisters in the intensive phase multi drug therapy for rapid replicators and in the continuation phase for the residual bacilli it is only it used to be two drugs but now the government of india has recommended three drugs during the continuation phase okay that is you know the first line drug the intensive phase is inh rifampicin ethambutol and pyrazinamide continuation phase used to be inh and rifampicin but now the current uh, recommendation by the government is to add ethambutol because 10% of the indian population have been found to have natural uh, resistance to inh therefore to prevent drug resistance now it is currently recommended to add ethambutol during the follow up phase you know that tuberculosis drugs there are first line drug and the second line drug the first line drug is inh rifampicin ethambutol pyrazinamide and streptomycin but however streptomycin is rarely used unless somebody develops the hepatotoxicity you have to know the weight of it 5 10 15 2 20 20 20 20 20 20 this is a commonly asked question what is the doses of each drug and what are the side effects so the most common side effects is peripheral neuropathy therefore you give a uh, belladon tablet number 2 the other side effect is hepatotoxicity most commonly with inh rifampicin and pyrazinamide and pyrazinamide also can cause an increase in uric acid therefore can have multiple joint pains therefore these are the common things what you have to know you should always start a do a lft before you start the anti tuberculosis drug so that you need to know the baseline and if you find the liver enzymes is double the normal value normally liver enzymes value is 35 to 40 if it is above 2 to 2 and a half times that means there is a liver dysfunction you may have to stop the therapy consult a gastroenterologist and start the therapy again depending upon the response later on the second line drugs i'm not going to discuss in detail it's available everywhere i mean the, there are various parenterals you have to remember by the uh, like aminoglycosides cycloserines and things like that it's very important that you have to remember these two line of drugs just remember about the new drugs which are there for drug resistance betaquiline and delamanide 
they are available in india pedicillin is available in india but its efficacy has been seen and tested mainly for pulmonary tuberculosis where it is found to reduce the duration of therapy usually drug resistant therapy used to be for 2 years in pulmonary tuberculosis with the adding of these therapy they have come down even to 6 to months to 9 months but you should be aware of this drug name but need not know much about that to summarize again the index tb guidelines by the government of india is a multi drug therapy duration is for 12 months daily therapy intensive phase hrzd for 2 months continuation phase hzd for 10 months okay what do you need to monitor during follow up esr lft and weight why weight a weight gain a sense of well being is one of the good indicators that the patient is responding to anti anti tb drugs signs of healing are weight gain sense of well being absence of pain esr progressively coming down and you can visualize by x ray initial 3 to 6 months x ray you will see basically no further destruction but after 6 months to 1 year it will show ossification new bone formation and healing of the lesion you can also confirm by mri or pet scan around 9 months to 12 months time the most important thing is to prevent failure counseling 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 and counseling you have to spend time with the patient explain to them the daily drug therapy has to be taken dosage has to be based on body weight other that is other common problem usually when people write they write akt4 akt4 is a standard for 45 kg individual but if individual is 60 kg then your dosage becomes significantly less patients complaints nutrition it has also been found that vitamin d is significantly low in these particular patient vitamin d supplementation helps in healing as well as recent studies indicate that vitamin c also might be useful in healing in patients with tuberculosis therefore what did the chemotherapy do it cured the disease it cured the disease much faster and without complications it caused spontaneous resolution of abscess with anti tuberculous therapy no need to further aspirate any more you see a multiple example of spontaneous resolution and you can see by mri the disease has gradually healed if you diagnose them early you see by 6 months complete healing therefore uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis is a medical disease what do you mean by that in the absence of deformity instability and neurological deficit tuberculosis can be easily be managed with the adequate uh, medical therapy whereas complicated tuberculosis is a different entity because what happens there is destruction instability pain deformity and neurological deficit in elderly also things are slightly different you have to know about drug resistant tuberculosis it's a common question it could be mdr tb xdr tb and totally drug resistant there are basically two types mdr that is multi drug resistant which is resistant to both inh and rifampicin <coughs> extensive drug resistance is resistance to along with mdr there is resistant to one fluoroquinolone and also resistant to one of the injectable anti uh, anti tb drugs totally drug resistance is resistant to both anti first and second line drug but is not recognized by the who but you have to know that you have to know what are the mdr tb means what is mean by extensively drug resistant tuberculosis and totally drug resistant tuberculosis i'm not going to speak about the management of mdr tb it is slightly scope of this uh talk but as an exam going standard you have to remember that the mdr tb regimen involves at least four second line tb drugs number 1 and it should be uh done for 2 years number 2 and it should be done basically as an orthopedic surgeon we should not treat a drug resistant tuberculosis it has to be treated ideally by a specialist or in a district tuberculosis center because tuberculosis being a notifiable disease the management of drug resistant tuberculosis is no more a responsibility of a orthopedic surgeon before uh, i go into the surgical aspect or we stop for a discussion a brief note about a paradoxical reaction uh, it is sometimes you may have to be aware of that a patient with a confirmed skeletal tb on att who initially improves and subsequently there has been a worsening the features include 
increased size of lesion, appearance of lesion, recurrent fever, night sweats, usually within three months. Okay, there is always an initial improvement followed by deterioration, which happens around two to three months. If you notice that, don't do anything, just continue the anti-TB drugs. Usually, they tend to respond better and it usually passes off. It's an immune response to the MTP antigens. Therefore, you have to be aware of that because just because you see some worsening around two to three months where the patient has initially shown improvement does not mean that patient has got a drug-resistant tuberculosis. In drug-resistant tuberculosis, there is no signs of improvement from the beginning to the time when you start suspecting it. So there we can discuss on yes. this. Yes, sir. There are a few questions, uh, sir. So how to correlate the neurological finding examination with ASIA score. Does ASIA score, is ASIA score applicable to TB spine? So actually a good question for most of the PGs are getting confused. So do you have to say ASIA scoring in TB paraplegia or deficit, sir? It depends on where you are coming from and depends on the examiners. I mean, uh, basically it's okay to say uh, an incomplete paraplegia or a complete paraplegia, number one. Some examiners might ask you about Kumar's grading, which even though is not applicable to nowadays scenario, but in the examination, they will ask. You can say Asia A, B, C, D, but usually examiners prefer to have a complete or incomplete neurology. Yes. It depends on the examiners and where you are trained, but don't worry about that. You tell what, what you have been trained in your institute. You just have to say, this is what we have been taught in our institute. Because each examiner will have a different uh, choice of, uh, I mean, uh, selection of uh, grading. Yes. So you need not uh, comment about Asia by yourself if the examiner asks, because Asia, uh, yes. if the examiner asks, you can comment. So what is the absolute criteria to stop ATT after 12 months or to prolong after 18 months? What is your criteria? How do you stop? So that is one I, I usually used to stop around nine months, but now since the government has recommended, because it's a notifiable disease, if that patient develops some issues, by law, you could be subjected to a issue. That's why I have extended now to give up to 11, uh, 11 to 12 months. What is my criteria? My ideal criteria is one is weight gain, sense of well-being. X-ray does not show any destruction, further worsening in the last six months. And slowly you might see ossification of the destroyed bone. Okay, that's my three basic criteria. You do MRI. I, if the patient is affordable, I usually get an MRI scan done to see the uh, conversion into a fatty bone marrow and see the resorption of the cold abscess. Yes, sir. Very uh -huh. rarely I extend more than 12 months. So the current recommendation, as sir rightly said, by Index TB guidelines 2020 is two months plus 10 months. So at the end of 12 months, you can uh, assess with radiology when, if good fusion is there and no progression. And if you are able to get an MRI, then that will be the best, and then you can stop. So, when comes the role of strict immobilization, and for how long in TB spine? Uh, see, immobilization is basically a rest. Therefore, you in the active stage of the disease, you can ask the patient to do activity to confer. There's nothing like a strict immobilization. If he is able to walk about and he is quite comfortable with that, he can do limited activity. Activity to comfort is what is advised. Strict immobilization is a patient who is unable to walk. In that scenario, you may have to consider surgery as an option. Yes, sir. Uh, I also wanted to ask this current question. Relevance of middle path regime nowadays? Uh, I will uh, include that in the next part, surgery when. Yeah, middle path regime, uh, sir, will include, but uh, we'll uh, discuss after that. So, role of intralesional streptomycin in cold abscess. Do you use and what do you think? Uh, not specifically. I, If I aspirate a cold abscess, I do inject streptomycin, but it is not a current uh, recommendation as such. Okay, sir. But there's no harm in just doing one dose of uh, streptomycin after you aspirate. Yes. And uh, very yeah. huge cold abscess but without any pressure effect or deficit, still go with ATT alone? This is another question. Yes. Yes. So this is very, very important uh, for all of you to understand that if you have huge cold abscess in MRI or uh, in the MRI, 
and if there are no other symptoms you can just wait and watch with att alone definitely it will uh, improve sir only with radiological features shall we start att uh, as sir already pointed out that we discussed this you have to do biopsy there is no doubt about it either no, but still, still as per the current uh, national guidelines based on a presumed tb if the facilities are not there then you can start okay and so you can that. start but if you are able to i would not advise it yeah it is better to go ahead and do but <laughs> if it turns out negative then we can see last question uh, last thing which i want to emphasize so before you come to the last part i just want to say why we should do biopsy basically to even if you are not confirming is tuberculosis you thought is in tuberculosis on the mri you do a biopsy bias turned out negative chronic inflammatory but still you think is tuberculosis based on the MRI, you can start TB drugs. But still, why you should do that? I could have done without biopsy. But you are ruling out malignancies. See, they may not be able to tell you for sure whether it's uh, bacterial or non-bacterial or tuberculosis. But they will definitely be able to tell whether it's a malignancy or infection. That's why we should do a biopsy. That is a very, very vital point. The main aspect, apart from diagnosis of TB, is to rule out malignancy. uh one more point which i want to emphasize is akt4 so it is always better to prescribe the anti tubercular drugs uh, based on individual uh, doses and individual drugs not as akt4 and few words about bedaquiline you may get this in your recent advances paper so actually it is one of the latest drug which is uh, prescribed and which is recommended for mdr tb that is uh, tb resistant for both rifampicin and isoniazide and its dose is basically it comes as 100 mg tablet its dose is 200 mg i mean 400 mg od for 2 weeks and they say you have to continue 12, 200 mg tds for 22 weeks basically the recommendation is you have to give for 2 years in case of drug resistance so that is the current recommendation just and it's available in the national tuberculosis control program yes sir so i think it is is provided by the belinda gates foundation Okay, sir. something like that but it's available in the national uh, this thing yes, part sir. of uh, national program okay sir. but important thing don't treat drug resistant tuberculosis but as exam going student you have to know different types of drug resistant the management of it as he mentioned suddenly somebody might ask you about bedaquiline therefore you have to know about it amma uh, please don't say that uh, sir it is not it is not our purview or in the exam so in the exam you have to be knowing the facts as sir yes. said uh, it is always better to consult an id specialist or gastroenterologist when it is drug resistant so now coming to the most interesting part as orthopedic surgeons so surgery when and what i think uh, i think we are dragging sir for long but anyway i think it's no no we'll summarize that we won't speak too much yes, unfortunately sir. i will not cover the topic which of exam point of view but i'll just tell you what you should read as sudhir might be able to explain that coming to the surgical aspect of uh, tuberculosis the surgical indications basically are patients with severe neurological deficit number one that is severe neurological deficit at presentation or new onset or deteriorating or unimproved neurological deficit during chemotherapy number two severe vertebral infection like pan vertebral disease spinal tris signs lack of improvement in pain after chemotherapy spinal instability number 3 kyphotic deformity like early greater than 30 degrees late any other severe uh, th things or when you don't have a diagnosis you do a biopsy is negative many times you still not sure that might be an indication for surgery therefore you have to remember this but as an exam going you may have to read of professor tulis book where there there a slight variation in the indication has been given uh just briefly about instability is basically is a very vague uh, term either a definitive instability when you got a spinal tris signs pain persisting while on chemotherapy is again a ill defined elderly patient they are not able to ambulate, ambulate again is a ill defined diagnosis of instability as i mentioned the risk factor for progression are age less than 10 years number one vertebral body loss greater than 1 to 1.5 when the pre treatment deformity is greater than 30 degrees junctional lesions and the presence of a spinal tris signs all this indicate that there is a significant instability and we need to operate on this particular patient 
coming to the middle path regimen of Professor Tully. Professor Tully was practicing in Banaras Hindu University at that time. And uh, as you know, of all these government institutions, then the patient load was significantly more. Professor Tully used to start the patient on anti tuberculosis chemotherapy and do them whenever the uh, OT time used to be available because there are so many tuberculosis patients. He noticed that there is a small, a good group of patients whose neurology started improving without undergoing the surgery. Therefore, then he came out with the middle path regimen. That means you start the patient with anti tuberculosis chemotherapy and wait and see if they come with neurological deficit. If the neurology improves, then continue the anti tuberculosis chemotherapy with no surgical intervention. If the neurology does not improve, then only he used to operate on this patient, especially when they are presenting with early, early, significantly incomplete neurology, not with patients with complete neurology. And that is the basis of how Professor Tully developed the middle path regimen. The MRA basis of this has been shown by Professor Anil Jain, wherein he analyzed these patients and found that patients whose MRA shows a cold abscess are the one who respond to the chemotherapy alone and manage only with chemotherapy. But if your neurological deficit is because of a bony element, like a compression or a subluxation, there is no chance of improvement by following a middle path regimen. Therefore, the middle path regimen came out of necessity at a particular duration of time when the OT times were not available. It's still practicable in this scenario, but if you want to do a middle path regimen, be sure that the neurological deficit is very early, number one. Number two, the neurological deficit is because of a cold abscess or an intraspinal abscess, not because of a subluxation or a retropulsion of the bone. Then it is better to operate rather than going through the conservative treatment and then see whether the patient is going to recover or not. Uh, <clears throat> Sudhir, if they want to ask about middle path or regimen or anything we can discuss now before we go to what surgery to do. Yes, sir. So any uh, doubts about middle path? See, as uh, exam going students, it is very, very important because you will be asked about middle path regime. Definitely, you should be knowing about middle path regime. Uh, so as sir said, initially it was uh, tried uh, because of long waiting period. Middle path as, as such, it was actually published by Professor Tuli, sir, during 1975 and it is Basically, it means you take a middle path. You don't go aggressive towards the surgical side. At the same time, you don't wait continuously, even if the patient is developing some deficit or something. So that is why it was called as a middle path regime. So you combine both. There is a doubt. Role of pre-op chemo. That is, I think it is ATT and postponement of surgery. Uh, there's no, uh, it used to be people used to think like that, but it is not necessary to start on anti tuberculosis therapy to operate on a patient. You can operate and then start start, start anti-TB3 chemotherapy. is not going to alter the outcome. Okay, sir. Now, uh, I'll uh, just ask a few, uh, I mean, one or two clinical scenarios for exam going students, sir. Suppose if they are getting, I think we are going to what type of surgery, right, sir? Yeah. Uh, so, I'll just ask this question now itself, sir. So, a, a student is getting a TB spine with paraplegia. It is not an acute onset paraplegia, maybe a few weeks old. So, that is the common clinical case scenario. So, MRI and X-ray suggest tuberculosis of spine. So, what the examiner's question will be, what will you do next? So, what should be the answer from postgraduates? So, you have to look at the, if the, if the neurological deficit is quite significant, in the sense that is the MRC grade is <coughs> less than three, okay? There is a significant deficit, is not able to walk and its deficit is more than three to four weeks, then I would suggest I will start on anti tuberculosis chemotherapy and also plan to do a surgery on this patient. Okay, sir. But if, so, the, if the deficit is only limited to only UMN signs, but patient is able to ambulate, a neurological power is grade four or grade five, MRI shows only a spinal abscess, there is no significant bone destruction, then you can say, as I would like to do like middle path regimen, you the drugs and see as to how the patient responds. It recovers neurologically by three to four weeks. Then I'll continue conservative treatment. If not, if it deteriorates, if there is no improvement, I might consider surgery. 
So as uh, sir rightly pointed out, so you can get two case scenarios. One, a patient with TB spine with normal neurology or less neurological deficit. What we mean by less or more is based on MRC. Whenever a patient has power less than three, it is called as more uh, neurological power or uh, it is otherwise called as uh, in colloquial terms useless power. Whereas it is more than three, it is called as uh, useful power or more power. So if a patient is neurologically intact, you have to ask for the clinical uh, history, instability pain, as I rightly said, whenever the patient has significant pain, when the patient is turning in bed or getting up or it is affecting his or her activity of daily living, then you have to keep that in mind. You have to ask for treatment history, whether ATT has been started. If ATT has been started, how long the patient was on ATT? So if the patient says, I was on, I'm on ATT for six weeks, but I'm not at all improving, my pain is persistent then that goes in favor of surgery. Those patients, you will think of stabilizing them or decompressing them. Whenever a patient comes to you with neurological deficit, with obvious compression in the spinal cord in the MRI, there is no doubt about uh, whether to wait or I mean, wait or not. It is better to go ahead with uh, surgery if the power is significantly less or if it is grade zero or if it is in severe spasticity. Because as Sir said, TB is a medical disease and earlier you intervene, the compression, the earlier you go and decompress the cord, the cord will, will have its chance because it is usually a wet lesion. So when you remove, the, there are high chances that the patient may get the power back. So those patients, you can advise surgery. So when in exam, when you're asked, what are the indications for surgery in TB? First thing is, acute, I mean, uh, new onset or worsening of neurological deficit during ATT. That should be your first and foremost answer. So first you start an ATT. Then wait. If the patient is developing deficit or not improving, then you have to go for surgery. Yes, sir. I think we can go out with the type of surgery, sir. Yeah. Hmm. Coming to the next question, which surgery to do? First thing we have to understand, what is the goal of surgical treatment? Okay, the goal of surgical treatment is to decompress, correct the deformity if there is one, and to provide stability. Decompression could be in the form of deprivement and drainage of a large abscess or decompression of the spinal cord and the neural structures by removing the lamina or soft tissue compression, that could be a part of decompression. Kyphosis correction is the deformity correction part of it. Stability can be done only by stabilization of the spinal instrumentation or by reconstruction of the anterior column. Therefore, these five components of surgical treatment need not be applied to every patient whom you are going to operate. Depending upon the patient's uh, presentation, we need to use some of this in a particular management of a particular patient. Therefore, either we might use only uh, decompression and instrumentation in some case. In some patient, it could be deprivement, decompression, reconstruction and stabilization. In some patient, there could be addition of kyphosis correction. Therefore, some part of this phi needs to be involved when you are planning your treatment of spinal tuberculosis patient. Therefore, how do you achieve them? There are three surgical approaches. Anterior, combined, and all posterior. But laminectomy per se is contraindicated in anterior spinal TB. When In which tuberculosis you can do laminectomy alone, especially if the patient has got neurological deficit, is only in posterior element tuberculosis. But majority of the tuberculosis, what you see is the anterior spinal tuberculosis and laminectomy only alone is contraindicated. That's the first message you should get. The second thing, the anterior surgery is classically called as the Hong Kong surgery. It was popularized by Hodgson and Stock when they were the professors in Hong Kong. Okay, because Hong Kong was then under the British rule. Therefore, the surgery came to be known as a Hong Kong surgery, which was the anterior spinal fusion for treatment of spinal tuberculosis. An example of this scenario. The one of the common questions that might be asked for you is what is the difference between a Hong Kong surgery and a modified Hong Kong operation? The basic difference, if you think this is the diseased vertebral body, in a Hong Kong procedure, a classical Hong Kong, it used to be removal of the whole of the vertebral body above and below and the intervening disc. 
the gap used to be very huge and the chances of failure of this fusion used to be higher. Therefore, modified Hong Kong is what we do practice in nowadays scenario. Basically, you remove only the deceased bone and put a graft or a cage in between. Therefore, you are retaining the part of the vertebra above, part of the vertebra below, and the discs above and below. That is one of the commonest questions that you might be asked. Anterior surgery now is basically done in cervical tuberculosis. In the, in the thoracic and thoracolumbar tuberculosis, most of the centers have moved away by doing an, from doing an anterior surgery. We do it basically everything from behind. One example of a cervical tuberculosis where anterior surgery still is the mainstay of treatment. Anteroposterior surgery may be necessary if you are choosing your anterior surgery as a treatment of choice. Whenever there is a significant bone destruction, in patient who has got a drug-resistant tuberculosis or a patient who has been previously operated and response is not very good, you may have to go in anteriorly, debride and reconstruct and then also come and do the posterior instrumentation. A few examples of an anterior and a posterior surgery. But the choice of surgery has changed over time. And now, most of our surgeries in tuberculosis are from thoracic T1 to the lumbosacral junction is done from behind. It's basically because by posterior approach, you can do debride, you can decompress, you can reconstruct the anterior column, you can instrument post posteriorly and correct the deformity. As I mentioned, these are the five principles of your surgical management and they all can be done by a posterior approach. It's an approach which is familiar, familiar for us spine surgeons. And this is an approach which we can do it much more safely than doing an anterior procedure. And that's why today, apart from cervical tuberculosis, a posterior approach remains the mainstay of your management in spinal tuberculosis. I'm not saying anterior surgery is bad. Anterior surgery is still the best. But however, we can achieve all the goals. What you can achieve by an anterior surgery by a posterior approach. Therefore, what are the types of posterior surgery? You've got a posterior instrumentation with or without decompression. Number two, you can reconstruct the anterior column by transpedicular or a transfacetal debridement and posterior instrumentation. Or you can, you can just do a posterior closing or you can reconstruct by a transfacetal, transpedicular or a costal transfacetomy approach. I show some example. Here, patient had a kyphosis, but it was not significant. You just did a posterior stabilization, gave anti-tuberculous chemotherapy. You can see eventually it heals because tuberculosis of the cervical of the spine basically heals by consolidation. consolidation. Therefore, once you stabilize, give anti-tuberculous chemotherapy, patient is compliant, usually heals without any major consequences. One more example of a good healing. Therefore, especially in patients who do not have a significant deformity, do not have a significant vertebral body loss, a posterior only surgery is an ideal treatment. And my choice to do a posterior alone surgery is in thoracic or a lumbar spine. Whenever there is a posse segment disease, that means the disease involving only the adjacent vertebral bodies. Vertebral body loss is less than one. Kyphosis is less than 40 degrees. Multi-level involvement. You just do a posterior alone surgery. If there is a defect in the front, you've got two options. The simplest option is to do a posterior laminectomy and gently compress what is called as posterior shortening osteotomy. Posterior shortening, not osteotomy. Or you can reconstruct from the front this is what I meant by saying there is a disease here. You've done a laminectomy and compress. You're just compressing it. You're shortening posteriorly so that the angulation in the kyphosis is properly corrected. You see, this is what happens. And the second option is you can reconstruct it to the transpedicular root or a transfacetal root. Remove the facet joint here and then you can reconstruct it using a cage. That is a posterior reconstruction from behind. That is called a posterior global reconstruction. 
this is one more example of a posterior global reconstruction to a partial costo transvasectomy approach in the examination you will be asked many questions like trichotomy anterolateral decompression costo transvasectomy approach I, i think it's essential for you to do that read that but nowadays even though you are doing a costo transvasectomy ideally we go through a posterior midline incision put the instrumentation then remove costo is the rib transverse transvasectomy means the transverse process you remove the rib you remove the transverse process approach the anterior aspect of the vertebral body clean it and then you can do a decompression uh, instrumentation or reconstruction using a iliacris graft fibula graft or using a cage okay this is an costo transvasectomy approach traditionally when costo transvasectomy came people used to use an incision which is convexity away from the midline you remove the rib and then it used to be mainly for decompression or debridement of the diseased vertebral body but nowadays we use this approach along through a posterior midline approach with instrumentation and reconstruction see this is what i meant a transfacetal reconstruction where you debride and put a cage but when you have to put a long cage like this it has to be a costo transvasectomy approach in the lumbar spine you can do that with a transfacetal approach disease cure is not everything in tuberculosis as i mentioned that childhood tuberculosis can progress therefore you in children especially you have to follow them for a longer duration of time till the growth is over so that an example which is one of the study patients of dr ashikran when he was doing his post graduation and then his thesis 0 month 40 degrees 60 months 105 degrees and 180 months 128 degrees this was a patient who was under care in the madras uh, mrc trial patients therefore the disease healed but the deformity progresses therefore this is what you should prevent to conclude uncompleted spinal tb you can treat it medically you have to identify what do you mean by uncompleted and complicated if surgery is indicated in posterior only surgery is an adequate in most of the cases what you do from posterior whether a instrumentation alone whether you decompress whether you reconstruct whether you do a deformity correction depends on each particular case anterior surgery even though was the initial method of surgical intervention the hong kong and the modified hong kong procedures but right now it is useful definitely in cervical tuberculosis in other areas depending on the center where you practice number one there are surgeons who still prefer to do it anteriorly their results are very good with that that is really good or in situations when the patient has been previously multiply operated the recovery is not very good you can choose an anterior surgery when do you do an anterior posterior surgery an extensive multi level vertebral involvement and in junctional tuberculosis you may need to do an anterior posterior surgery sudhir uh, yes, discussion sir. about surgical part uh, thanks a lot sir uh... it was a wonderful and excellent uh, session i think it, uh, it would have been this is i think it, this is far more than sufficient for, for all the post graduates so before concluding uh, let us discuss few things about uh, surgical options and the principles behind surgery uh, as sir said so you have to understand that tuberculosis is an anterior disease so usually the examiner will ask if it is an anterior disease the pathology is anterior then why do you want to do a posterior surgery so in those cases you can say that uh, we are going to instrument we are going to achieve stability the goals of surgery is to achieve stability neural decompression and anterior column reconstruction or support that is very very important that anterior column reconstruction that's what that, that is what sir meant by anterior uh, procedures so if you do all posterior means you are giving an anterior support either in the form of bone graft or in the form of cage by a posterior approach that doesn't mean that you are not giving anything anteriorly so you are giving anterior support by a posterior approach so that that's what he meant so uh, one question is easier to say why we are doing this you can always say that we can we can do the decompression we can do the stabilization we can do the reconstruction from behind and uh, this is what is practiced in my institute yes 
Yeah, nobody can uh, uh, this thing about that. There's nothing like a hard and fast rule of management. There's many ways to skin a cat. Therefore, whatever you are doing, your institute is the best thing for you to quote in the examination. Why do you are doing this? This is how we are being taught in your institute. Yes, sir. So that uh, okay, uh, sir. One question from Professor Tanapan: Rational of leaving implants over infected area. It's a very very vital question for PGs. <laughs> Uh, tuberculosis of the spine, basically, the uh, Voga et al. has shown uh, by study that the biofilm formation is very, very less in tuberculosis of the spine. Therefore, in tuberculosis of the spine, implant instrumentation usage came back into practice more than 20 years ago, 20 to 25 years ago. It is basically credit goes to Mr. Yoga, Dr. Yoga, who showed that in tuberculosis bacteria, the biofilm formation is very, very less. But basically, in any form of infection, you can leave an implant nowadays. Prefer preferably titanium, number one. Number two, you should have done the adequate debridement. You can, there's no harm in leaving a implant inside. In the spine, fortunately, the blood supply is relatively good. And uh, the biofilm of tuberculosis bacilli is lesser. Therefore, there is no harm in leaving an implant, provided you've done a good uh, debridement. Most importantly, patient is compliant in taping, taking the TB drugs. Okay, sir. Uh, so, any role for prophylactic stabilization for early mobilization? Yeah, definitely, yes. As surgeons now, we are finding less incidents, less indications to operate. Therefore, nowadays, we tend to um, uh, operate on patients. I mean, I would definitely, I'm mean, just joking. Definitely indicated in an elderly patient who has lost the ability to uh, be to ambulate. Just by stabilizing and giving anti taking a biopsy at the same time, patient is able to walk, is relieved of his symptoms, and we do know that the elderly patient ambulatory potential is one of the most important significant factor for survival. If they are not ambulatory for three to six months, their survivability chances become significantly lesser. Yes, sir. So, to prevent the complications of immobilization, definitely, yes, especially in elderly frail individuals who will develop bed sores or chest infections earlier. Any, uh, okay, sir, is there any change in the ATT regimen for relapse of treatment failure cases? As discussed, I think we discussed this earlier. So, any so relapse? Or if there is a relapse, the treatment remains the same. But first thing, you have to confirm that you have to do a biopsy or do a gene expert, confirm that it's relapsed, it's not drug resistant. Provided it's not a drug resistant, the treatment remains the same. If somebody has stopped a drug after two months, he comes to you at four months saying that he stopped the drug after two months, you have to start it afresh and think that you have to give the drugs for next one year. Yes, sir. So, role of spinal brace in TB spine? <laughs> Definitely, yes. Uh, in uh, you have there is uh, regarding the pain there is one important thing you have to um, understand pain in thoracic tuberculosis is relatively lesser thoracolumbar tuberculosis is more whereas the lumbar tuberculosis for the first two months the pain is significantly more because it's a mobile segment whereas in the thoracic segment the rib cage provides protection therefore what is the use of the brace the brace is only to brace externally to limit the movement of the spine. Without your knowledge, you try to bend forward, turn around. It definitely helps to relieve the pain and helps the patient to ambulate during the acute phase. Yes, sir. And you have to remember, it takes about six weeks to two months for the TB drugs to start showing a good clinical response. Okay, sir. If clinically and radiologically we are suspecting TB and for some reason biopsy is delayed, then can ATT be started? Yes, as yes. far as answered that. I tell, you, I tell you very, very, it's quite common. Like, for example, we see a patient who comes to us. He has got an MRI done. You say, you tell everything that is tuberculosis. And the next question he will ask you, sir, how much does a biopsy cost? Then he says, sir, I'm not ready today. I'll come back later. But I, what I usually do is that, okay, till you come back, I'll put you on a trial of anti-TB drugs. And please do not stop this drug, even though we are not done the biopsy, you please come back. They usually come back around three to four weeks, then said, sir, I'm already feeling better. 
is it necessary to undergo a biopsy? Because cost is a big issue. You have to take that into consideration. If you are not going to start him on anti-TB drugs, he's not going to take any medication. He will worsen neurologically. Therefore, in my opinion, if the patient is not doesn't is economically not able to do a biopsy, it is worthwhile to start on anti-TB drugs in presumed spinal tuberculosis. Yes, sir. And uh, what effect will it have on biopsy when done later? If you start ATT without Usually, biopsy? it shouldn't have major uh, effect because the tissue diagnosis can still be achieved by biopsy even after three to four months. In Usually, if he's already responding around two months later, I would not prefer to do a biopsy. He's already responded. A therapeutic response to a TB drug chemotherapy is there. Therefore, I'm not going to confirm it. Okay, sir. If healed disease progresses in a child, what is the treatment? Uh, it depends on the deformity. You have to do what is called as a vertebrectomy because tuberculosis, when it heals, it heals with a lot of kyphosis. Okay. <laughs> Therefore, uh, it, it needs a very major surgery, what is called as a vertebrectomy, but the prognosis is very, very bad in this scenario. So basically what uh, sir is telling is you have to do multiple osteotomies. There are various osteotomies, opening, closing wedge, and you do vertebrectomy, removing the entire vertebra and the prognosis and the complications are uh, significant. So we have to uh, be aware of that. So we do, uh, from Professor Tanapan, we do get lots of disseminated spinal tuberculosis. Is there a role of surgical treatment or do you prefer only conservative treatment in disseminated spinal tuberculosis? <laughs> In disseminated spinal tuberculosis, if I am able to diagnose them early, when there is no neurological deficit, when the bony destruction is less, I would still prefer to treat them by medical management only. Because surgical management in these patients, if you are operating at two or three levels, they are already immunocompromised, nutritionally compromised. If there is no indications for surgery, even though indications are very mild, I would try to avoid operating on this particular group of patients. Okay, sir. So, various methods of biopsy in TB spine and what is commonly followed, sir? This is from our... In our institute, we do uh, CRM guided biopsy. So... There are only... See, there are, when you look at biopsy, if you've got a lesion which is accessible by ultrasound, a cold abscess which is accessible by ultrasound, you can just do an ultrasound guided aspiration. Our cold abscess is there in front of you. You can just put a needle, aspirate, send it for gene expert. If it's not accessible, it's inside in the bone, then we have got two options, CT guided or image guided. Still in our unit, the image guided procedures, CT guided procedures, the yield with the radiologist is less. For the simple reason is that uh, they may not be, even though they are there at the particular site, they are not fully trained interventional radiologists. Therefore, in our institute, we prefer to do a trans biopsy. So, uh, in that case, uh, it is always better to do a trans bi biopsy because the sample which you get is uh, significantly oh. high compared to CT-guided biopsy. Because usually with one oh, but CT-guided from... biopsy, you have to understand the root can be the same. It could be CT-guided or a fluoro-guided. Whereas, fluoro-guided is usually trans -pedicular. CT guided could be transpedicular or parapedicular. So, so the usually they get one to one point five mm of tissue only with one yes. mm of tissue only when they cut, and it depends on the uh, expertise of the uh, interventional radiologist. So that is important thing. And uh, adding to this question, sir, we usually read in. Uh, uh, I mean, we read that uh, TB can result in fistula formation and other things. So, what, okay. suppose that TB TB can. The, the earlier concept, if you see, uh, traditionally, when I was doing the post-graduation, we used to aspirate tuberculosis. While aspirating tuberculosis cold abscess, we used to follow a technique, what is called as the valvular technique. That means when you put a needle in, it goes to the skin, and then you move the skin, and the needle goes into the fascia in a different plane. So that the whole idea was to prevent a sinus formation. Because before you enter the abscess, your skin needle penetration is different and the facial penetration is different. 
Okay, that was to be the worry. But antitubulous with the use of antitubulous drugs, even if you put an incision over a cold abscess, it will heal. It does not cause sinus formation. So that is a very interesting point. Uh, so okay, how long should we give ATT to look for improvement if given on basis of clinical diagnosis alone? See, uh, in my opinion, it takes two months. In lumbar tuberculosis, it may take. Actually, patient will come at four weeks saying that his pain is worse. It's very common because it's a mobile segment and lumbar tuberculosis, when it collapses, it collapses with the loss of lordosis. Therefore, till it stabilizes, they will have a lot of pain. Usually around six weeks to eight weeks. Yes, sir. So usually it's around uh, six weeks to eight weeks. And one thing which I want to add is like, uh, if the patient comes to you with uh, persistent pain or worsening of symptoms, like SAR says, within two months after starting the ATT, please don't go ahead with MRI immediately. Look at the uh, x-ray, it'll give you an idea. Unless it is, uh, unless the patient presents with deficit, because again in MRI, you will see a enlarging abscess and everything will worsen because of the reasons which Sarah stated. So, from one another delegate, what is extended posterior circumferential approach? See, it's an <clears throat> approach which is probably described by Anil Jain, Professor Anil Jain, where they do is the midline skin incision. And then at the level of the apex of the deformity, put a T-shaped incision, put a horizontal incision. That means it becomes a T-shaped incision. I presume that's what uh, uh, is asking. Yes, and sir. then you approach uh, the rib, you remove the rib and approach from the side. Basically a lateral extra cavitary approach called the Leica or the costotransfectomy approach. So, uh, one last question from Dr. Suresh. Uh, Transpedicular biopsy, what instrument do you use? See, when you are doing a biopsy anywhere in the body, any skeletal biopsy, the first thing is you have to look at the MRI scan. Is the lesion soft or is the lesion hard? If you've got a sclerotic lesion or early phases of tuberculosis, you have to use a jump shade needle. You need to use a bone biopsy needle because the bone is relatively harder. In tuberculosis of the spine, I still use a bone biopsy needle, but if the lesion is very, very soft, what we usually use is a thin biopsy forceps, something like the arthroscopy forceps, which goes through the hole and you take the soft tissue off. Because whenever there is a soft tissue, the needle, even though you are trying to aspirate, it doesn't pick up tissue much. Yes, sir. So, in case of soft lesions or granulation tissue or something like that, you can use 1 mm disc punch also to go inside and you can pull off. I think that's it, sir. Thank you for your uh, <laughs> a wonderful lecture and I think, uh, and thanks for bearing me for this two, two and a half hours. I think it is, uh, it was uh, really I very, pleasure. and I think all of the PGs would have had a great time and uh, most of their doubts, uh, doubts would have been cleared with this session by your uh, extraordinary lecture, sir. Uh, just one last thing for the PGs, suggested reading for TB spine, usually TB spine uh, is not given in uh, Western books like Campbell or other things. So you have to pick up some articles. You have to read uh, Thule's, uh, that is for sure. And the JBJS uh, paper, uh, the latest paper which was published in 2020 by Dr. Anil Jain, Rajshikaran sir and Ajay sir. And Ajay sir's paper in uh, seminars in spine. And Dr. Rajashekar and Sir's paper of uh, risk of progression of uh, kyphosis and spinal risk signs. And uh, papers by Dr. Anil Jain. All these papers... Actually, think, Anil Jain has come out with a book on osteoarticular tuberculosis. Yeah. So, if you are able to yeah. uh, get that, I think it will be... Uh, I think you guys have to read that for sure before going to exam. Uh, exam and I think uh, it will be of great use. I once again uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Ajay Sir for uh, giving... <laughs> And I thank the organizing committee and the academic uh, committee of TNA. Especially Dr. Tirunarayanan. Uh, especially Professor Tirunarayanan, sir, for roping me in. I'm honored, sir, to be a part of this excellent teaching program. And uh, I thank you, Tirunarayanan, sir, for uh, roping me here. So that was on behalf of uh, TNOA that I invited, sir. Mm -hmm. I have to thank yeah, my true, but, uh, you are a... and the core team, sir. It's okay. I so, and, uh, so, and I also invite uh, Professor Tanapan and, for, and uh, Dr. Suresh for the closing remarks and uh, for uh, uh, thanking you, sir. Uh, over uh, to Dr. Suresh and Dr. Tanapan, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful session, sir. All the points are clearly told to the postgraduate students to clear the doubts. It was very much basic 
but all from the basic to the level of surgical step and it was also pre it was also very much planned to ask the questions in between so that no question is left unanswered it was an excellent session by professor ajay prasad shetty i thank professor as well as dr sudhir for his very good interaction with the post graduates as well as to the speaker thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh, i would sir, like to say thank everybody uh, especially to uno the president secretary and the educational committee my special thanks to sudhir actually I, i can say that i am proud the way uh, sudhir has progressed and the way he moderated the meeting today thank you all thank you sir thank you Thank you, sir, uh, thank you thank you once again sir again okay. on behalf of tnoa we have to really express our uh, you know, thanks and gratitude towards your time that you have spent and uh, of course wonderful uh, sessions sir. there's no words uh, i don't know i don't think uh, it should be explained say wonderful ala vandu i don't think <laughs> we can say on that sir so there is uh, no testimony to that uh, your uh, wonderful lecture and you covered everything sir uh, sir tanapan sir ninga thank you sir thank you so much sir whenever we much. listen to your lecture we have, we have become a student we have today and uh, we also thank uh, dr sudhir for uh, wonderfully moderating the session sir it's a wonderful session i think all the post graduate who attended the class have benefited uh, much more than they could uh, uh, go and read an entire book thank you so much sir thank so you meet on next friday Good for night. the important uh, and spine sir thank you sir thank you so much okay. thank you thank, thank you, you sir sudhir uh, thank you so much sudhir Yeah, you were right. uh, wonderful and uh, you know you made it so lively and uh, so discussed so much so okay. thank you sudhir and uh, once again thank you sir thank you thank you bye good night thank everybody thank you bye uh, ramesh thank you ramesh uh, alambek thank you ramesh again for uh, the uh, you know time that they have uh, given us and uh, suresh sir and tanapan sir also thank you sir thank you, and, uh, thank you. so i think we'll meet again on friday sir thank you thank you bye. தனியா வருது அப்படியே அமுக்கிட்டா ஒட்டிக்கிறேன்